This episode of the Bloody Vegans podcast is brought to you by Veg1 from the Vegan Society. Veg1 is the nutritional vitamin and mineral supplement designed for vegans by vegans. Launched back in 2005 and rebranded in 2021 with a fantastic new plastic-free package, Veg1 provides nutritional support alongside a healthy and balanced vegan diet, all for an affordable price. With a six-month supply available for just £12.70, Veg1 will cost you little over £2 a month and offers EU nutrient reference values, or NRVs, of vitamin B12, D3, iodine, selenium, B2, B6, and folic acid. Veg1 is chewable, it's affordable and reliable. You can take it once a day. It's available in fantastic orange and black currant flavors. Super easy and convenient, completely plastic free. So why not head over to vegansociety.com, search for Veg1, and take your next healthy steps into the world of veganism. This is a Bloody Vegans production. Yeah, sure. So um, I think like I've always been conscious of like the world around me, which I know sounds a bit weird, but even as a sort of young child, I... I remember like my dad often complaining about things like the lights being on, taps running, so on. And instead of equating that to like, oh, it costs us money to use those things and he's obviously doesn't want to spend money on lights being on. Um, I was like, oh, is the world just going to run out of water at some point? Like, what's that all about? <laughs> and, you know, I was sort of eight at the time. Um, and I, I sort of always remember having like this weird sinking feeling about the planet, which is right. unusual I guess for my age but when I hit 12 I like we, we grew up in a house full of like I guess what would be companion animals now but were pets back when I was a kid um you know dogs cats rabbits you name it birds all sorts were there that usually uh, adopted or taken in from people that didn't want their want them anymore um and when I hit about 12 I remember it was like my 12th birthday and we'd gone out to laser tag um for you know like you do because i was 12 and we'd yeah. gone to um you know a famous uh fast food chain to mm-hmm. get food afterwards and i remember sitting there and saying to my group of sort of 10 friends that i had brought with me to laser tag was like by the way i'm vegetarian now and i was holding a chicken sandwich <laughs> <laughs> and uh right. and uh, you know obviously everyone looked back at me and was like what do you mean you've gone vegetarian and I was like you know I don't eat animals anymore and they're like well what's in your hand and I was like okay after this I'm going vegetarian and uh yeah so technically I've officially been vegetarian since the day after my 12th birthday <laughs> and uh yeah and I, I was it was always for you know a lot of a lot of like the conversations I would have with people like the background is always for the animals in my mind I I didn't like the thought of um you know what would happen if I killed an animal to eat it like I couldn't imagine myself doing that so why would I put another person through doing that so I could eat them but I hadn't made that like click about veganism at that point mainly I, I guess like the world was different like it was the like early 2000s restaurants had like one vegetarian option let alone vegan options nothing had even suitable for vegetarians on the packet there was like nothing really um and so i had already thought that i was doing more than enough back then and um anyway like the first vegans that i met i was at university and it always like sparked conversations with people that would be like you know well, what about you like you eat like eggs and milk and i would always have this like I guess I fell for the marketing, right? The the like, well, it's animal waste. Like I was brought up That's to believe funny. that cows just make milk and, you know, we need to milk them. And somehow they didn't do that without human humans existing. They would unfortunately just explode from all the milk that they yes. made, right? And um and it it just never really made any sense. But that that was what I believed, like back then. I was quite strong about it and I um I you know, fast forward a little bit more ahead to the my mid-20s I guess I'd been vegetarian for over 15 years at that point and 
I stumbled across a YouTube video that was like, no, this is the dairy industry. Uh, no, like chickens who are male just get like incinerated in a little weird mincer because they mm. don't contribute to the chicken industry, right? And I remember like having arguments with my mom about free range and mm. all of that stuff. And then just watching these videos, just like, okay, that's exactly what I've been trying to be against my whole life, but have have didn't know that that was a thing right and that was just obviously with food um there was a separate journey about cosmetics and animal testing and uh discovering Anita Roddick and the body shop and and all of that hard work that she was doing back in the 80s to really bring that to light right like don't you find it unusual mm. that we have it the wrong way around like products should say tested on animals on the pack not not tested on animals like it should be yeah. something that like people are allowed to know if that's happened and make that choice rather than just assume maybe they haven't like unusual to me but yeah so I'd already started that journey from a cosmetics place but I got to like 28 watched this video and was like okay what do I do because I don't know anything about veganism I don't know where to go and quick google search obviously the top two charities that came up because I guess veganism's predominantly run by charities was the vegan society and all of their great information and recipes um and veganuary who you know mm. are a charity they've managed to um completely disrupt a market in they started in 2014 right so this is the the only the eighth veganuary that has existed but at the time, like that was, you know, 2018 was one of their peak years, I guess, where there was a really big jump in people that knew what it was. And uh, I speak to lots of companies now who still just think it's a month that exists, like Stoptober yeah. or whatever, right? That's just got a weird term, but has no overarching history behind it when actually there is um, a big charity behind it. And I remember being like, right, I'm going to do it. January is my month. I think the try, the transition between... Um, you know, obviously wasn't eating much dairy and eggs anyway, but going that final step. And um, uh, so I was one of the official pledges, I think, of 2018. <laughs> um, so I am in one of those numbers, I think, for their year. And the I, I really remember like at first just being like, what am I doing? Is this the right decision um like what does this mean for like me is it right obviously so many people question everything that you're doing all of a sudden when you do something that isn't normal or like normal um to to what's going on around you but what was so lovely about the January was obviously you got an email every day which was cool um but it was just like a good resource that was like here are some facts based on science here are some documentaries you can go watch here are some that don't have any animal cruelty in so that you don't um you know get sad about that um mm. and and that that was it really you know that first month felt really scary like I'm not gonna lie like it felt really scary for me and I was only transitioning from vegetarian but it was like I am I feel so out of the norm right now and I feel so out of sync with the world but I know that what I'm doing is right right and there's like an ethical implication here and and there was a few things that were like great I was like oh my goodness I have been told that as a vegetarian my only source of protein is eggs and I've never liked eggs and I've been forced to eat them and now I don't have to eat them and it's magical and lovely and I never have to look at a yolk again um but like I say there were some things like chocolate and and I, I never wanted to like lie and pretend that it was like an easy adventure so like my friends would be like oh how are you finding the cheese and I'd be like it sucks like we just don't eat cheese <laughs> over here in the vegan land. It's fine. But now, like, you know, obviously we fast forward just three years, four years. There are some amazing cheeses. I did a wine and cheese pairing uh, at the weekend and, you know, you can just eat them on their own nowadays. There's there's still some, some questionable products, obviously, yeah. but there's some really great <laughs> items out there. And... Um, and yeah, and I remember being like, cheese and chocolate, I'm just going to have to like forego those for the animals. It's fine. And I remember in my head always just being like, you need to remember like, this is a journey. Like you're not perfect. Don't feel horrendously guilty if you make some sort of error or you eat something by accident or, you know, you're finishing off products in your cupboards or whatever. Um, but at the same time, I was like, remember why you're doing this. You're doing this because... Mm. 
of the animals, right? Like this is not just, for me personally, it wasn't for my health. It wasn't for like, um, uh, a, a, like any of the other reasons. It was, f it was for the animals and it was for the planet. It was, I don't want things to suffer so that I can live because that isn't a necessary thing that can occur. And so every time I came back to that, it was a bit of a slow adventure. I would like go back on myself a little bit here and there and then as the you know the rest of the month and February continued that was it I was like right no this is me now I'm actually one of the few things that I really enjoyed about it was like you know obviously there's the the the, the, bit, the bit about fear but actually I felt like I was really part of a community finally and a community that made sense to me for once like I was like okay yeah. there are Facebook groups when somebody says that they're really upset about the animals like I agree and like it doesn't feel hypocritical mm -hmm. there's no confusion here like I just I'm just so here for this right and I, I I genuinely felt like I was within a community there's there's not been a person that I've met who you know doesn't doesn't kind of resonate that fact back that there's always there's spectrums within it there are people who are like super aggressive and um you know want to show scary stuff and then there are people who are just like we're just cracking on like this mm. is you know we're all making our own little impact or whatever and there's all the people in between those two scales of the spectrum and it's just so nice to connect with people from all those different strings and hear that no matter what there's something in common going on there right there's some positive positivity that's happening out of that um, and so, yeah, so 2018, like I remember going to, I signed up to loads of vegan festivals, signed up to all the Facebook groups. Um, at the time I lived in Luton, um, started looking out for all the vegan, uh, restaurants, like shout out to Monstera Canteen. If you're ever in Luton, please go there. They're a <laughs> magical bunch, um, who have a, a solely vegan restaurant, um, in Luton and a really, really cool guys. Um, we like... I, I remember like being like, right, I'm going to go to this thing called Vegan Camp Out, going to the Just Fee show, Veg Fest. Like I went to every single one because I was like, I want to know what all the vegan products are. I want to talk to people who are excited about veganism. I want to go and make some friends. And, and that's exactly what happened. You know, I went to Just Fee and I became a member of the vegan society before I was even <laughs> staff. Um, I remember, I think if you signed up at that particular event, you got like a free goodie bag of things. And I was like, yes, like this is when I'm going to sign up. <laughs> uh, so I got my free goodie bag of things from the vegan society, um, became a member that obviously gives you access to things like newsletters and discounts. They've got, I think one of the good ones, one of the best ones probably is the, you get 10% off at Holland and Barrett, which, uh, was good back in 2018 was one of the yeah. few places that you could buy vegan things <laughs> doing your weekly shop there. yeah Not that long so, ago. <laughs> uh, saving that 10 percent was really vital right and actually for the sake of the cost of the membership like in some instances you'd make that back just in that discount but also it was just like you know i'm helping fund that charity um and and figure out what's going on from there and then yeah and then went to vegan camp out stayed in the lonelies area for anyone who's been to camp out or knows about that there's there's a big lonelies area so you don't have to worry if you go on your own you'll make some friends and I I ended up sharing a, a 12 person tent I think my now friend Natasha brought um with uh, eight other ladies and that's it we became vegan friends so that was like a huge a huge win because no one in my family is vegan uh no one in my family is vegetarian not many of my real close friends are <laughs> veggie or vegan. So it was quite cool to start this sort of new circle of people. And then, um, yeah, fast forward to 2020, obviously pandemic hit. Uh, I was furloughed. I worked for a large car manufacturer uh, corporation and I was furloughed. I had just been promoted in February and then I was furloughed in April. <laughs> So I had just done a huge amount of work and then reached a point where it was like, okay, we don't need you anymore. Thank you for launching that car. Goodbye. Um, which to be honest was magical. Like I had five months of sitting on my sofa. Like that has never <laughs> happened. I've worked every day for most of my life. Um, so actually having like a really long break was quite nice. Um, I lived on my own at that point and it was just me and my cat and it was summer obviously we couldn't really go out and see many people but it just was uh, I guess a bit of a welcomed break um despite obviously everything that was going on at that time and 
uh, over at the Vegan Society, I guess, I had been keeping an eye on a few of the jobs that they had um, coming out, but I knew for my particular level of experience, there wasn't anything that had come out quite yet that was in line with what I was looking for. But then in June, um, the marketing manager role came up, uh, specifically, obviously, the role that I'm basically doing now. Um, and I remember being like, right, I'm going to take a month to apply for this. There was a month to... <laughs> A month they leave it open for a month and I was like right I'm going to fill in this application it's going to take me a month and I'm going to look at it every day and I'm going to double check that everything I've written makes sense because I'm like this is my job and I remember mentioning to my my old boss um she had previously left the corporation not just like message my boss and was like hey I'm applying for this job can you help um so my previous boss and she she just replied and was like that job just looks like the job for you like I, if I was to make up a job it would be that right and um and yeah and like uh, a few other people mentioned it when I was like yeah I'm, I'm considering this job but it's in Birmingham um I'm not I'm not 100% sure yet obviously like I've got to work out what I'm doing at my corporation and then uh I applied for it anyway and the process uh was a little bit back and forth I think it took another month to even have an interview um back with the vegan site and I guess that was a result of you know at that time like the vegan site I think were also considering following people they weren't sure if anyone was gonna want to take on the trademark I guess or if businesses mm -hmm. were going to put that as like a lower level priority because it is a cost and um and move away from it but actually none of that happened we've just continued to keep growing uh which is super exciting but the the like I guess the logistics of of hiring for the job that I was going for just took a bit longer than I guess normally how we recruit now and uh yeah and I had my my interview in July and I thought oh my goodness like what am I going to do with my current job like what do I do and then uh the next week my company offered up voluntary redundancy and I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for voluntary redundancy. And I somehow convinced my, you know, actual boss that it was the right decision to pay me to leave. Um, and it actually managed to just completely coincide. So I s accepted my voluntary redundancy back in like end of August. And then I started, um, sorry, yeah, around August time. And then I started like a couple of days later with a vegan society. So I didn't really even have any downtime so for me I was like this I don't know if the universe is telling me that this is supposed to happen I don't know if that's a thing or not but it feels like that's supposed this is all supposed to be happening so um yeah so I came into the role um in 20 back end of 2020 um the department was like a couple of people um who mainly managed like the vegan trademark has its own set of social media channels that are slightly separate to the charity just because it's about talking about vegan products and you mm. know we don't we don't want to clog up the the charity feed with all of those great campaigns and education pieces with just lots of products everywhere so we we've got a separate set of social medias and uh there was a person who managed all of that and wrote some blogs and created some amazing content and then we had an events officer and that was the team and uh and then I came in and that you know I I still consider it my dream job even to this day I get to talk to brands every single day and either try and get them to add more vegan products how to launch their vegan products how to talk to the vegan consumer how to um you know manage that completely new market for a lot of businesses that we work with there are some great businesses that just happen to be vegan and then there are some that introduce ranges or as a result of working with us, just transition to, okay, yeah, we'll just turn everything vegan because that's an easier supply chain, which happens mm. as results of conversations that we have or events that we go to or people that we meet, which just even now just feels, you know, it, it doesn't sound like real that my job is to tell people about veganism and they listen. <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, like I say, yesterday we uh, we had a little event with one of our newer clients who have just launched um, three new flavours of donuts uh, and they're all registered with a vegan trademark and we just headed over to one of their spots and got given some free donuts to take pictures of and make fun Instagram reels and TikTok content 
for um which just doesn't it just doesn't sound real but it is and um <laughs> and yeah and I just that that full journey is um is now just like a, just culminated in yeah this is where I'm supposed to be I think that, that vegan trademark thinking right back to your journey like because I think it sort of it has a sort of a place for all of us as in the vegan community I think you sort of like your your eyes are somehow kind of trained to spot it I think <laughs> from across uh, from across the the supermarket aisles and so on what what did it kind of represent to you going into it and then when you were when you were part of it did did was there a kind of almost a bit of a weight to that in a sort of odd way yeah no like it's uh it's so interesting isn't it because what started as like just looking on pack for somebody to maybe put that it's suitable for vegans somewhere in tiny writing um Mm. but then actually finding those products that are like no this says it's vegan and then looking up what that symbol means and seeing it's no animal ingredients no animal testing uh no gmos no processes enzymes um, management of cross contamination, all of that sort of work being done behind the scenes. You go right, okay, yeah. I don't need to read a big long ingredient list unless I have, uh, you know, an allergy or or something yeah. that I specifically don't want. But I no longer have to remember e numbers or have that app that tells me if an e number is plant based or not. I don't have to have, you know, I don't have to keep Carmen in my head or uh, mm-hmm. uh, confuse that with another. Uh, another chemical term that I I don't know the meaning of and being able to just look out for something that's from a third party because I think that's the that's the the real important part I guess of the trademark is you know anyone can make make a claim because there's no legal definition of vegan um so anyone could technically do it without any backlash at the moment even though obviously it is a veganism is a protect is protected in British law under the Equality Act there's very little against businesses who will just say, yeah, yeah, yeah it's vegan. No worries. Um, right. You know, which so, there are some really good examples of businesses receiving backlash mm. for saying that something's vegan or plant-based and it not being because, mm. you know, it's cooked on the same grill or it's fried in the same fryer as, as meat, et cetera. Um, and being able to just, know that that's something that not only I was supporting as a member of the vegan society, but that like, it's so easy to just be like, okay, I can, you know, even now I think my, I've got a 10 year old niece and uh, my sister-in-law has mentioned they're not vegan, but when I come for dinner, she sends her around their local supermarket to (laughs) round up the things that have that symbol on because they know that I can have that. Right. And then she gets to pick from that what, what I'm going to have for dinner. Um, and just that kind of like ease of ease of process and being able to come into that and not only like talk to businesses about the impact that that has on vegans because some companies are just like yeah we register but we don't put it on the pack we just we just make up our own symbol it's fine um which Mm. like to us that doesn't make any sense because that's what we're used to looking for but to somebody (laughs) who doesn't understand veganism yeah and or the process of like looking for something that's vegan for you to eat like to them they're just like oh this is just like you know registering for an award (laughs) it's a thing that we've done but we've not thought about it right and just being able to talk to businesses and remind them of the importance of the impact of having the trademark and knowing the reassurance that it gives to people is just like it's just so exciting for me and it's so fun and hearing new businesses come on board or hearing people decide that they're you know they're coming out with press releases so some great examples like Wagamama's 50% of the menu being plant-based of which most is registered with us um Burger King saying that they're going to make 50% of the menu by 2027 I want to say Body Shop saying uh, the whole range is going to be vegan by 2023. Like these are all just so, they're huge household names and just hearing yeah. the impact that, you know, Veganuary, the vegan society have had on that journey for people just feeling like it's mainstream. is just so, so fun. Like I say, like for me, I my journey was like, I don't feel like I'm part of the mainstream. I feel like I'm this person on the side who feels very right about what I'm doing but nobody seems to hear what I'm saying to like you know fast forward just three years and 
so many people are like, there's a new term now, there's flexitarian, right? There's plant-based Mondays or whatever it is, meat-free Mondays and TV ads from Violife and Corn just running, uh, you know, primetime television on ITV mm. um, with, with, you know, big celebrity sponsorships. Like it's just such a small period of time, but such a huge leap. And I think, you know, those two charities have had such an impact on, especially the British vegan community, right? What's the range of conversations like? I'm fascinated <laughs> by that. Like, you know, when you go and speak to different businesses mm. and it sounds like it's, it's often a quite an educational conversation in a way yeah. that perhaps they don't really understand, like you say, the weight that uh, having, having a vegan trademark on something carries. Perhaps they don't really understand who they're talking to when they're talking to vegans. What, what does the range of conversations sound <laughs> like? You know, from the you know, without dishing any names or anything, but yeah, <laughs> the companies at the at the one end of the scale to the other, like where are, where are companies at? Um, like we'd have such a range, right? So the vegan trademark registers anyone with a product. So that could be a startup that wants to get certified right from the beginning or a small one person business right through to, uh, like I say, like the global brands like Body Shop, Burger King. And for a lot of companies, like a lot of our conversations then range, especially within a marketing context from like, hey, can you give me a social media post <laughs> to, uh, you know, because in their mind, it's like, well, you have more followers than us. Hopefully that mm. will get us some sales. There's some support there from your company, which, you know, we do try our best. Um, but we have over 58,000 products. If we, I think if we posted <laughs> every product in a year, we would be posting one every few seconds. Um, which of course anyone who manages social media knows that that's not humanly possible, but the, the, like the, there's the people right at that. And they're like, we, you know, we've, we've got the trademark. We know what it means. We just need some support getting out there. Um, to people who are like somewhere in the middle that are kind of going, okay, I don't really understand media. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know what are vegan publications? I don't know, you know, I don't know how to write a press release because I am one or two person business and our job was to, be to develop this product, not to promote it, right? And like, yeah. that's some support that we also provide as well. So we've got um, the lovely Francine in our press and media team who will sometimes help write some some PRs and get people on the BBC or get people on Channel 4 to talk about their products. Um and then, like you say, we've got the other end of the spectrum, which is people just going, can you just come and talk to our company and tell us about what vegan is? Because we do that. We provide workshops right. to supermarkets and big chains and uh, large companies, sometimes even before their trademark holders, to help that company understand. And for some of our companies, they will tell us quite openly, you know, this is a trial. The heads of aren't vegan... Right. They don't care about it. I've suggested it. I'm fighting for it because I think that it's a good market to move into. And they're saying, if this fails, we're not picking that back up again. And so I need you to help me make this successful um, and educate me on what that means. And lo and behold, it launches and they call us up a week later and they're like, great. So yeah, we've had sign off to extend the range. Uh, it's going to come back as permanent or, <laughs> you know, uh, anything from that. But there's also like a real a real chunk of businesses who like when I talk to them, I'm not getting the vibe that they're just like listening to demand. Obviously that demand is there. Right. Businesses work on supply and demand, so they will be working towards that. But there's a real like passion project. You'll see vegans right. weaved in and out of that company. Um, there are some partner companies that we work with who maybe can't register a product, but they'll maybe help some of our businesses in some way. And there's, you know, there'll be a vegan in there maybe um, or someone who maybe just cares about sustainability and sees vegan as a, a great area within that like spectrum. So a lot of mm -hmm. the people that we work with are like head of sustainabilities for companies. Um, and then sometimes we have people tell us that openly their CEO has just decided that veganism is a thing that they need to do now and that they, <laughs> they need to get on board. Um, we've had companies like be like, so the CEO thinks that we should launch this product. What do you think about developing that? 
And like, that's also quite fun because then we're right. like, actually, no, we think that it should be this. This is what the vegans are missing out on. And then sometimes so they come back. asking you for product advice. <laughs> yeah, which is quite fun. Wow. Um, wow. But yeah, and just like the 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 lovely thing about the vegan society right is that it's so like sort of central to the to the movement so we know lots of publications we know lots of names of other companies that will work together and you know activists or ambassadors and influencers that we can then share with these companies so that they all start working together and you know it grows the community but it also helps that brand understand that we're like a really open and accepting community that wants to work with these people and this episode of the bloody vegans podcast is brought to you by veg one from the vegan society veg one is the nutritional vitamin and mineral supplement designed for vegans by vegans launched back in 2005 and rebranded in 2021 with a fantastic new plastic-free package, Veg One provides nutritional support alongside a healthy and balanced vegan diet, all for an affordable price. With a six-month supply available for just £12.70, Veg One will cost you little over £2 a month and offers EU nutrient reference values, or NRVs, of vitamin B12, D3, iodine, selenium, B2, B6, and folic acid. Veg One is chewable, it's affordable and reliable. You can take it once a day. It's available in fantastic orange and black currant flavors. Super easy and convenient, completely plastic free. So why not head over to vegansociety.com, search for Veg One, and take your next healthy steps into the world of veganism. You know, continue hopefully to grow what is a, uh, you know, already thriving vegan market across as many industries as we can, right? feel pretty rewarding when you get <laughs> a big product or a big company to sign on or perhaps even change a range or from the back of a conversation that you might have had a year ago and then you eventually see that product you know, on, the, on the shelf and so on. <laughs> How does that feel? Yeah, it's, it's, do you know what? It's like, obviously it's not just, it's not just me. Like there is a whole team of us. The majority, I think, of the staff now at the Vegan Society work for the trademark because of how many checkers we need to make sure those ingredients mm. and things are all right. But the work that they do is, you know, we've nearly lost clients because of secret recipes and therefore they don't want to tell us what ingredients they have, which oh, makes yeah. it difficult to check. Huh. Um, when actually we're like, we don't need to know percentages. We just need to know what's there. We are on non-disclosure agreements. We will not randomly publish ingredients anywhere. <laughs> um, we just need to know for our, for our sake. And we've, you know, the work that the team have done to then bring that company back on board. Um, like you say, the, the joy of speaking to someone and then a year later hearing them come back um, has happened to us for a few clients, even in the short time that I've been there. Um, and we have, there's a person in my team as part of our like sales drive. We go out and talk to businesses, of course. Um, and there's a person in my team who does mock up bits of artwork. So when we're on a call with a client, we can't do it for all of them, but for some clients we will fake put the trademark on the front of their pack and superimpose it and be like, this is what it could look like. What do you think? You know, almost like a, here, please try it on uh, kind of <laughs> sales technique. And it's just so cute to like see not only that piece of artwork get really great feedback because they're like, oh, wow, yeah, that looks really great. Like we'd love to do that. But then actually seeing it in real life come back because like it's a lesson in how to not misuse the <laughs> misuse the logo and where, where great placement could be and hearing seeing them do that. But also like there's some there's some brands that have like gone out on a whim with us, right? So like New Look is a great example. They're, the fashion world doesn't need certifications in a lot of instances, right? Like food is so regulated. People have to, for the most part anyway, have to disclose a lot of their ingredients and things. So there's a lot more transparency there. But in fashion, you get that like weird label that just has like a diamond shape and is like other materials, that's all you need to know is in here, right? And there's no, there's no like onus on businesses that much really to do that. And New Look was one of the first sort of big high street brands that came to work with a vegan society after obviously a lot of calls about why it would be good to move their accessories and their shoes over to a vegan supply chain. And even with working with us, I think they 
they learned how, you know, as a business that have been running for over 100 years, how complicated their supply chain had gotten because of how many questions we had about their supply chain, which then just led them to go, why don't we just make everything vegan? And then we just have one, (laughs) one line where we're not getting confused and makes our lives easier as a business, right? And then that kind of like started a a chain with them that was like, right, well, we're going to switch all of our accessories and bags and shoes over to being vegan by, I think it was 2024 was their, um, was their statement. And just all of that came from like conversations within our company, which is just so, as somebody that, you know, back when I was a teenager, I was a a retail supervisor at New Look. So it's like a weird circle to then come in and see them, you know, just being so open in an environment that doesn't have that much consumer demand just yet, but they're setting the standards so that that begins, right? Like, that's so cool. That's fascinating to me because the cynical view that I'd heard, thought, or maybe even, maybe even sort of thought about myself sometimes from a company, say, like, I won't say New Look specifically, but from t- take a take a clothing company that's, that is, uh, maybe they sell, like, things like handbags. And if they're at the lower end, I think my cynical brain said, well, those weren't ever leather. They've just figured out a way to, to sort of sell them as such. But it's fascinating to me that actually, no, it's not necessarily like that. They've, they've had to have their supply chain scrutinized to a point where there was actually some changes to be made within there yeah of course and what's so fascinating about the fashion world like i say because it's not massively regulated like Mm. a lot of the cheap i guess the cheap alternatives to leather prior to you know the big boom of the last few years where we've got apples and cactuses and pineapples all contributing to the alternative leather community Mm. Um, it was PU, right? It was it was PU and PVC. Yeah. And so to us, it's like, well, that's plastic. That's fine. But actually, one of the like big misconceptions is that for a lot of companies, without even knowing this, the supplier and the factory would spray a fine layer of leather over the oh. top so that it looked more premium. And well, over a plastic. Over PU, right? So or like PU, yeah, yeah. the the idea huh. being that they're using way less leather. They've obviously turned it into a liquid, which I don't want to know how that process has occurred. But the that's become a thing to make something cheap look expensive. And that process has just become so simple that that happens, right? And I'm not saying that that's what happened right. to New Look. It's just a very common no, but it's a thing. thing about yeah. that ingredient, right? And then what can happen is even if you're in a product line in a factory that's doing that and you're saying, no, I don't want that like spray of leather, that particle is now floating in the air because it's not just mm. a thick, um, unfortunate bit of skin. It's like a piece of floating moisture right and so yeah. there's then been companies that have like done there are now we've got like even lab tests are like registered with the trademark um as vegan alternatives and we've got a couple of companies now on board who do actual dna tests of fashion materials mm. and ingredients that go into the making of like shoes and clothes and bags that can even find if that thing began as dna that was an animal which you know, it's that's amazing. It's um, it's amazing that people thought to do these things in the first place, <laughs> but now yeah. we're getting to the point where there's so many. You know, somebody has now thought that the pineapple and banana skins are useful, which mm. is way more advantageous to us than raising a cow for some reason. <laughs> you know what I mean? Amazing. Like, why yeah. did we not think of the pineapples? and the banana skins being all across the floor when we were harvesting bananas. Why did we think, I know, let's keep raising (laughs) those animals. But at least we're here now. from a practical point of view, I mean, a banana is a lot easier to wrangle. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? It just doesn't make any, there's no sense to it on any level. Not even a very practical commercial sense. Someone somewhere found it. Like, there are so many things that we find that are, like, unusual. So, like, you know, the, like, red food colouring. I think it's Mm. E120, which is uh, carmine. Comes from raising bugs under sunlight underneath cactuses and then squishing those those bugs so that you get their blood. Like, 
why was that a thing that somebody thought to do over, you know, smushing up a carrot or a beetroot that naturally squeezes out red yeah. colour? Like, I just... That bit of the world is confusing to me, but the lovely news is that we're so much further along now to, like, not only finding out that these are practices, but also helping businesses move away from them. And that, you know, again, with that supply and demand piece, the bit in the background is if the suppliers get more demand for vegan alternatives, those alternatives get cheaper over time because they're buying more of them Mm. and they're producing Mm. more of them. And then hopefully the the meat and alternative in the you know that industry reduces and therefore has to charge higher and then they naturally move away and you know one day yeah. governments will stop subsidying that as well which will of course make it more expensive but like that whole like cycle just that's just one industry of course like when you think of the cosmetics industry as another example that I think the statistic is something like ninety five percent of all animal tests are irrelevant because when you move them to human trials, we are so different in DNA yeah. that it's irrelevant, right? And yet people just continue to yeah. um, to do those to do those. But like I say, like even having like lab tests and companies that are like either we're willing to work with humans and humans are willing to work with us to just do the tests, or uh, we've got one company registered who use papaya enzymes to do cosmetic testing which is magical to me <laughs> how does that work or is that is that is, is that a scientific question too far yeah so, i think sorry you've, if it is. You've, you've taken me one step too far <laughs> reach the but, limit. <laughs> but, yeah. it's fine. i'm gonna go and find out though because that's crazy yeah. yeah um yeah papaya extract i think there's a potato involved there's 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 a good few bunch of vegetables and those enzymes that ultimately I think the whole process um, on this particular test that I'm talking about is um, there's a label on cosmetics you know the little tiny pot that's got a number above it with an M so it's like a little tiny yeah, yeah. cosmetics pot um, what that is is a, a, a specific test that happens to tell you how long that product has been estimated to be good at before potentially harmful yeah. bacteria can get into it right so if it says 12 m right. once you've opened it it's supposed to be okay for 12 months whether you choose to listen to that or not is your own prerogative but obviously that requires a test which usually happens on animal cells where they um, put the product on an animal cell, they will then introduce the bacteria and see how long the preservatives last in terms of like keeping that bacteria out, right? Because obviously we don't want to put creams on and the harmful bacteria also get into our skin, right? So it does make sense. But this company have created an alternative using papaya enzymes to do those tests, which... Uh for some That's reason amazing. works and I'm very much here for that <laughs> you're blowing my mind here Erica this is great oh good <laughs> <laughs> I, I have another I have another if you don't mind I don't want to be too like the vegan paxman here but I've got another cynical point of view that uh, from the that I've heard in the vegan community that I'd like to put to you can we please rename you the vegan paxman because I love that <laughs> I'm not I'm if you, if you listen to any of the rest of my episodes I'm certainly not direct <laughs> enough for that I'm a very gentle <laughs> version of it I can't think of a more gentle interviewer now but uh, very much it's more like vegan gardener's world or something it's much more <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have practice. I have segued you to banana leaves and papaya enzymes. So. Yeah, I mean, we're right right up my street. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, the the cynical point of view: January, the uh, January brings a lot of companies to the to the sort of vegan party, if you like, and a lot of them disappear again in February. You mentioned Stoptober earlier, and this kind of thing, and many folks within this sort of community will say. Big companies are just cashing in on this vegan pound. Actually, it doesn't um, move the needle in terms of veganism overall. It's almost treated like a diet for a month and then they'll move on. And actually, some of these big companies end up selling more animal based products because, you know, they've brought their vegan mate has brought another five people in to the restaurant or to the whatever shop, whatever. A viewpoint, Mm -hmm. not necessarily you know, not endorsed by the Bloody Vegans podcast necessarily, <laughs> but a, in my darker moments, maybe I've thought like that, but 
Um, truth be told, I probably flip flop sometimes and feel a mm -hmm. bit like that sometimes. I, I'd love to get your perspective on it. Like I say, mm. not wishing to be too vegan packs many. Yeah, of course. I think the initial statement is, you know, everyone's free currently to make a choice, right? So if you think that a company is ethically cheating you, greenwashing, uh, has worse practice behind the scenes, but is offering you a vegan product and you mm. disagree with every other ethical practice that they have, you don't have to buy that product, right? Like we still have a choice with our money and the whole environment of veganism is that we are making a choice with our money already in choosing to yeah. spend it, like you say, on the vegan pound as opposed to any other. So first and foremost, you know, if someone has a strong view about it, you can ignore that company just as much. But from what we've noticed over like, you know, obviously I'm going to be hugely biased by the vegan trademark. <laughs> but what I mean by that is like, there's some great examples of companies who, yes, may have started in that way, but then went down a semi-legitimate route by seeking out s some vegan experts to talk to, hearing that they're, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot more logic behind the scenes as to them as a company and and why they need to move more into that world and and how to get there right and i'm gonna throw out Krispy cream sorry to put you under the bus gang but hopefully this is a good enough story you know they launched last week january with their vegan version of the og which i think is a a great starting point and for Krispy Kreme, that meant, you know, they've got real great hype. They got excellent sales in January, but they didn't release it in their stores. They only did it online. So mm. maybe it wasn't as good as they wanted it to be because uh, you could only buy them in boxes of 12. And I don't know about you, but when you live on your own, maybe 12 boxes, 12 donuts isn't quite something that you can get through in a day, right? So they went away and then they spoke to the vegan trademark and in the background continue to develop more products. Maybe they went away. They then decided the OG was going to come back as a permanent feature. It is, I think they started January thinking, oh, we'll just do this because it's January. Like you say, we'll, we'll just utilize on this. But the sales were so good that they're like, okay, well, we'll keep that permanently. So you could always get the OG on online. And then they actually made the extra step of coming and talking to us over the Vegan Society, which meant registering with us, developing three new donut flavours, obviously also registering the OG. And then, you know, this January, it was, okay, those products are going to be in stores. And for them, like, of all the donut sales, I was told yesterday, the... Um, Fudge brownie vegan option is like in the top five of all sales this month, which mm. yes, that tells you a story of a company that has, that may have started. I can't attest to whether they originally just developed the OG because they wanted to make sales in January or not, but that's how it will have looked externally, but they've continued that path. Right. And as a result, the vegan options are now so strong that, they're contemplating them just being permanent options. And that then sparks a next story that says, okay, how many more options do we have? We might have to take an option away, just like that new look story, right? Like mm. we're going to have to yeah. start taking some options away to counter for this. And that piece of um, like strong development, right? Of this isn't just a January thing. Like look at Greg's, I, they're not a trademark holder, but Greg's were another huge example mm. of somebody that came on and was like, actually, we think we can probably get a vegan sausage roll. I don't know about you, but it took me three months to try it because it was sold out every single time I went into a Greg's <laughs> and there was two in my shopping center that was near me. Um, and that has now developed into like quarter of the shop. Like they have donuts as well that are now vegan. They, mm. Their mince pies are always vegan at Christmas. Like, and that part of like you say there is that part that says okay but also greg sell bacon and coffees and all of these other things that maybe we can't eat but the idea is if there is more demand from vegans that balance should tip eventually and we're in that lovely place yeah. now of 2022 where the scales have begun tipping you know the the vegan pound is so much stronger than 10 years ago, five years ago even, where for one industry, so the cosmetics industry, it pretty much just is the norm. Like most companies don't test on animals now. Most companies just make a vegan product because it's the most accessible that they can make it 
you know? And like that will mm. have started mm. from decades of work from the body shop, from Lush, from all these big companies that were like considered fringe brands in the 90s that now are just like in every shopping center, just as mainstream as everyone else and actually are making the competition then turn all of their products vegan. So when you look at a lot of cosmetics industry, I'm not saying like the big guys, you know, we've still got a long way to go yeah. with the L'Oreal's and the Procter and & Gamble's and even Unilever. But the idea is that the more competition there is, the more that they're then going to switch over, right? And some of those positive stories, positive conversations are going to... Businesses work on logic, like if you try and sell yeah. them something that won't sell, and maybe in the 90s, if we'd have tried this whole tactic that we're doing now, which is to reach out to businesses and talk to them about why the vegan consumer wants them, you know, in the 90s, when that percentage of vegan consumers and knowledge of veganism was much, much lower, that may have been, that may have like fallen on deaf ears. But now we're at this yeah. amazing stage where like I say, like that new look example is a fantastic one. What started as, oh, we'll just register some bags and shoes turned into, actually, no, we're going to change our whole, like a whole ethos of, of our accessory range. What started with the body shop, we've been working with the body shop now for years. We did our announcement in 2021 because there was the first range, but we've been working with them for years because we actually register, we're trying to register every single ingredient with them so they can just develop whatever they want and it just be vegan, right? And the the yeah. announcement has been that the they want their whole range to be vegan by 2023. The original conversation wasn't that they wanted a whole range to be vegan, but as they've reviewed their brand ethics and where they sit within their market, it just makes sense. And it's the yeah. same for a lot of cosmetics worlds, right? Like, So I think even Lush now is at 95%. Their like, last ingredient is honey that's making, you know, that last little 5% before they tip over to being a 100% vegan mm. brand. And that's all coming from like great conversations with companies that are saying, hey, like, yes, we're a certification service. Yes, we can look at the products that you have now, but actually have you considered your wider market? And yeah. marketing is, I mean, I'm obviously also going to say this as a marketing manager, but marketing <laughs> is just so important, right? So if your audience is and includes vegans and or your your audience is you know everyone within this area demographically even if that was what you were doing well that's going to include vegans and in the same way that companies have found great success in moving to having an entirely gluten-free factory because they want to include as many people as they can well the same is true for vegan right yeah. there's no point in having two factories one for gluten-free and one not for you just you just have the one that everyone can have right and make your pasta or chocolate or whatever you want and also then make it vegan. So I think the the concept's the same. I think, like I say, I return to there will be some places where you have to consider where your ethics lie, but whether you were vegan or not, mm. that remains true, you know? So like chocolate is an example of not just the big guys, like the little guys as well, like the ethics behind it is questionable. Coffee is the same. Tea yeah. is the same. But these are all things that are like staples that everyone just buys. So you have to just consider where it is that you sit within that within that scale, you know? We have we work with anyone that's got a vegan product. So we accept some of the backlash that comes, like you say, from the skeptics who are like, well, yeah, they're just here to make some money off us. Well, if you didn't buy it, the line would disappear again. Yeah. So like... They're not just going to keep making it when it's that complicated to make. The, the naive bit for me and the bit that you've opened my mind to and I hadn't thought about, and it, I don't know why because it it's obvious when you think about it, but is the fact that it's more of a conversation than a certification process in isolation. Yeah. The fact that you have a conversation and that conversation might lead to a change of lineup like we, we talked about with, with New Look, a change of practices through the supply chain it might even lead to a completely different product range or, or change of tack as a business. And that, I think, is the bit that I've, I've found really fascinating because I think the naive, the cynical part of me would have said, well, if you're just certifying it, then, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll get whatever products we can, make it as cheap as possible, bang with the vegan logo on it, and off we go. And l learning that it's way more than that is is actually 
just it, it leaves me with a very reassuring sense, <laughs> actually, even more so than before. So I think you know, as vegan logos go, is the it's obviously the the one that I think all of us trust the most. It's the it's the one, like I say, we we've trained our our brains to look at from across the supermarket aisle. But um, just understanding a little bit of beneath that, I think, is is so is so vital. Mm-hmm. So I, I thank you for that. What I have done though, in the process of being so fascinated by this is not talk to you much about veganuary. <laughs> so <laughs> so I want to just, I'm conscious of time because we, we have, we've chatted away and it's been absolutely lovely and mind-blowing. But um, I do want to get back to a veganuary question, if that's of okay, course. just to sort of begin to take us home, which was, you know, if, you, if you're advising somebody who's new into the community now, or perhaps, you know, you had your time again, is there some, is there an area that you would look at differently perhaps an area you'd think about earlier on in your journey or you'd advise somebody to? Yeah, like I say, I think your like baby steps are like certainly important. Like I went from vegetarian, like I changed all of my cosmetics, household cleaning, laundry, all of that stuff long before I went vegan because I was like, actually the cruelty-free aspect is my next level. Like I don't want to support companies that are testing on animals. So I'd already made quite a big transition before I got there. Um, but I would say like the, like pull out, like I have a lot of conversations with people who aren't vegan who say I would be vegan for everything, but right. And because of that, (laughs) but they're like, but then I'm not vegan at all. (laughs) Um, and for me, I'm like, (laughs) try that. Think about what your like, but is think about, is it chocolate? Is it cheese? Is it milk? Is it this? And try being vegan for the day for everything, but that and see how you feel Mm. about it. Right. And I I feel like that's accidentally the journey that I sort of went on. Right. Like I cut out all the things I didn't like anyway. I didn't like milk. I didn't like um, eggs, but I did make a lot of cakes. (laughs) So, you know, it was that I've still got so much baking equipment in my kitchen. And now there are so many alternative things that I use. Apple cider vinegar is like on a a whole shelf because that makes up (laughs) so much of my baking. Right. And like, like I say, like, just, just try that or, just try rather than thinking of is there an alternative to bacon that I can have because I think that was the thing for me right so you're so ingrained in I think if I'm talking about food because I think that that's the biggest hurdle yeah you're so ingrained in what the like plate is supposed to look like in that it's in like thirds mm. because that's what the like UK government has told you should be and you've your brain is like <laughs> there must be like veggies on a third <laughs> and like protein on a third and general carbohydrates on a third like when you actually start looking into nutrition you realize that that's complete nonsense right and that most veggies are also carbs and but they're also all these other vitamins and no one food is just one nutrient right like mm. so my advice is like 100% like break away from what that plate is supposed to look like and if that means throwing lots of things in a pan with some sauce on top and putting that on a plate well then that's what you're going to be doing right (laughs) like and that is what I do a lot of the time when I'm cooking and um you know I think like I enjoy cooking, like I enjoy being in the kitchen and baking and cooking. So I enjoy experimenting with flavours. There are so many more flavours within the vegan world because you're trying all these different fruits and veggies and spices and herbs and lovely things that you wouldn't normally be trying. But that's from my perspective of I like cooking, right? If you don't like Mm. cooking, there are loads of alternatives now that are available. But I, like I say, like in my head, I think just just break away from that idea of you must have a protein on your plate you must have a carb on your plate you must have then some sort of veggie color on your plate like ignore all of that just put together things that make sense to you so if that means throwing some grains in with a load of veggies and some mushrooms then so be it there'll be protein in there there'll be carbs in there there'll be other nutrients Mm -hmm. in there you'll get them but that I think is probably my main like if I could do it differently, I probably would have been better at doing it <laughs> if I'd have realised that earlier. <laughs> well, that's that's the journey, I guess. 
but sound advice I love that <laughs> Erica it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you I could, I could chat to you about big and trademarks and the <laughs> commerce of it and the marketing of it for hours excellent um, but <laughs> respectful of your time so I better let you go but it's been an absolute pleasure and hopefully I'll speak to you again soon yeah thank you so much this episode of the Bloody Vegans podcast is brought to you by Veg One from the Vegan Society Veg1 is the nutritional vitamin and mineral supplement designed for vegans by vegans. Launched back in 2005 and rebranded in 2021 with a fantastic new plastic-free package, Veg1 provides nutritional support alongside a healthy and balanced vegan diet, all for an affordable price. With a six-month supply available for just £12.70, Veg1 will cost you little over £2 a month and offers EU nutrient reference values or NRVs, of vitamin B12, D3, iodine, selenium, B2, B6, and folic acid. Veg1 is chewable, it's affordable and reliable. You can take it once a day. It's available in fantastic orange and black currant flavors. Super easy and convenient, completely plastic free. So why not head over to vegansociety.com, search for Veg1, and take your next healthy steps into the world of veganism. This is a Bloody Vegans production.